I don't think we're able to think about issues like nuclear and sectors like nuclear as an us versus them anymore. That's the voice of Dr. Caitlin Turner, a research scientist within the Space Enabled Research Group at MIT Media Lab. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Michelle Dover. Welcome back to Press the Button. That was the voice of Lauren Billet, our new communications and marketing manager who will be helping produce Press the Button. Welcome to Plowshares, Lauren. Tom, how was your weekend? Hey, Michelle. Great to see you again. It was very quiet and restful, which was good. Uh, As some of our listeners may know, we had a board meeting last week, so it was nice to have a quiet weekend uh, recovering from the board meeting. As great as they are, it was nice to have a a quiet weekend, and I want to wish everyone a happy Veterans Day that's coming up later this week. So thank you to all the service of the veterans out there. And some update on news from last week. Uh, The Iran nuclear deal talks that have been delayed for so long are expected to resume in Vienna uh, at the end of November. So we'll be watching that very closely. And today on Early Warning, we'll discuss the Pentagon report that came out last week on China's military. Uh, I'll give just a short editorial comment. There's rising narrative in the Pentagon that the U.S. can't afford to reform its nuclear policy, such as no first use or sole purpose, because China may be increasing its nuclear forces. The irony here is that one way to look at what China is doing is that China is responding to U.S. policies that it sees as threatening, for example, that the United States has a much larger arsenal than China does, uh, that the United States has refused China's call to join it in its no first use commitment, uh, and that the U.S. deploys missile interceptors that raise questions in China's mind about its ability to retaliate to a U.S. strike. Uh, And now the U.S. may be responding to China by escalating tensions yet again. So, you know, I see this as a very dangerous cycle uh, worth a lot of conversation um, and debate. So please stay tuned for our coverage of this important issue in just a minute. And after that, I sit down with Dr. Caitlin Turner, a research scientist in the Space Enabled Research Group at MIT Media Lab. You might remember her from Press the Button Live. And I asked her to come back on so we could expand our discussion on how to build a more inclusive field and what is holding the nuclear field back from transformational change. It was just such a fantastic conversation. I'm really excited to bring it to you all. So keep listening. Looking forward to hearing it. And of course, as always, if you like what you hear, dear listener, please hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback helps us improve the show. And with that, let's get into the episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dell. The big news last week was China, which is reported to have launched an orbital hypersonic weapon and appears to be building about 300 silos for land-based ballistic missiles. And right on cue, the Pentagon has released its annual report on China's military developments, which is getting a lot of media attention. Among the key findings of that report are that China's nuclear expansion may enable it to have up to 700 nuclear weapons by 2027 and 1,000 warheads by 2030 compared to about 300 nuclear warheads today. And just for context, the United States and Russia each have about 4,000 nuclear warheads. China responded to the Pentagon's report by saying that the United States was the real threat, saying, quote, the world will decide who is doing nuclear madness. By smearing China and playing the trick of thief crying stop thief, the U.S. can only amuse itself and deceive the world, unquote. So what do we make of all this? Are we in a new arms race with China? If so, can we get out before it's too late? To help us figure all this out, we have Hans Christensen, Director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. Hans, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So Hans, first of all, 
What surprised you the most about this new report on China's military? Well, I guess it was the sort of very significant increase in their estimate of how many nuclear weapons the, United, uh, the, the Chinese might have in a decade. And the reason it was so different was because it's only a couple of years ago that they said that it might double uh, or a little more than double uh, from uh, what they estimated in the low 200s uh, at that time. You know, so you could imagine that would have been something like, you know, 400, 500 something weapons or something like that. And suddenly here, you know, a year later, kaboom, um, we're up to very large numbers, relatively speaking, obviously, for, for China. Um, and so the surprise is, you know, why, how, how is it possible in one year of intelligence gathering to, to jump so high? And, um, and when, when you read the report, they don't really provide evidence or sort of um, explanations for exactly where they get that number from, um, or those two numbers, I should say. Um, there are a couple of odd references in there for it. One is what they describe themselves as um, sort of Chinese hardliners. Um, and another one is an obscure study by a Western NGO about how much plutonium China potentially could produce if it died, decided to do so uh, with new facilities it's, it's working on. Um, but there's nothing that says, you know, we have conducted this uh, joint intelligence review and, you know, everything we can see points to this. It's sort of, it's a little lightweight. Um, that said, of course, um, <laughs> there is a lot going on with the Chinese nuclear modernization program and, and sort of over outpacing them all is, of course, this enormous silo construction project there they've started on. But that was known, uh, you know, to the Pentagon a couple of years ago. And in fact, uh, you know, I would imagine that some of the things that the uh, U.S. Strategic Commander, uh, Admiral Richards, said uh, early this year about maybe even in a tripling or even a quadrupling of the, the stockpile uh, was based on their knowledge, of course, about those projects. Um, so here we are. Now we get some new big numbers and, you know, there's a lot of hype, of course, about and concern about what China is up to. What does it mean? How do we, what do we need to read into all of this stuff? And uh, what are we going to do about it? So exciting times. <laughs> Indeed. Um, let's talk for a minute about China's response. They basically said, hey, you know, we have a small arsenal. We support no first use. You don't. Uh, you, United States, you're the threat. W what do you make of that? <laughs> well, you know, it's like that's the way governments respond to these things. I mean, it's not like, I mean, what do we expect them to do? Say we're sorry. <laughs> um, of course, the, the, you know, they they go out and they counterattack and they do sort of non-denial denials <laughs> where they sound like they're denying it, but actually not saying something specifically to the to the information. Um, so instead, you get this barrage of sort of, you know, talking points. So we've heard over many years. Um, but the problem, of course, for the Chinese government is that um, it said basically the same things 10 years ago when its nuclear weapons modernization program looked a lot different. And, and so, of course, one thing Chinese officials will have to explain is, you know, how, how could you have a minimum deterrent back then with, you know, a couple of hundred nuclear weapons if, you know, in a decade, you are also going to call it a minimum return if you have a thousand warheads, you know. So there's something missing here that the I think it would be smart of them to try to explain. Of course, uh, the cynical part of this, of course, is that any nuclear power, no matter whether they have 200, 2000 or 20,000 nuclear warheads, will always insist that whatever they have is the absolute minimum they can have for national security. Right, right. And uh, last question for you, you know, in your view, how should the Biden administration respond to these developments? Uh, should there be policy change? What should we do? 
Well, so the Biden administration is in the middle of a nuclear posture review right now. And so force structure, foreign threats, uh, how to respond to it, what to say about it, all these things are going to be, you know, turned over. And so coming out of the Chinese issue, it's not a new thing that the Chinese are modernizing and then they're increasing. They've known that for, for, for many years. Um, but because of this dramatic new numbers, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how they respond. And of course, one of the things we, we sort of urge them to do is not to overreact. We don't want to see this kind of um, hyper back and forth, uh, worst case scenario, uh, the sky's falling kind of plan. Um, they need to keep a cool head, sit back and say, how does this affect what we think China would do or could do? Um, and, and what can our forces do in response? And this is where I think that, you know, if the, if the United States used to have a lot more nuclear weapons to deter China with than they have today, um, that obviously didn't stop the Chinese modernization program. Um, so the Chinese are not going to respond well if we turn up the nuclear heat. They're going to, of course, just make their own countermeasures. And so we have to be careful that it's not sort of a... a, a knee-jerk reaction that comes out of this, but that we think um, sort of calmly about what it means um, also in the long term. So I think I think what we've heard from U.S. military forces consistently over the last decade is they're very confident in the capability of the stockpile and the arsenal uh, that we have to meet the presidential guidance. And so I doubt there will be a significant uh, uptick. Um, in fact, I think the U.S. modernization program will largely continue the way it has been structured. Um, we'll see if they, I think it's more interesting to see if they're gonna use this one to save the nuclear sea launch cruise missile that uh, the Trump administration proposed, or they're gonna say, nah, we need to spend our money on other things so um, that can go. Um, but I think beyond all of this stuff, of course, what's really important is not just the military issue. You have to come up with a grand strategy that involves some very serious and intelligent forms of uh, engaging the Chinese uh, on these matters, even though they may not want to talk at first. There are other issues they want to talk about. And so we need people who can sort of pry that door open so we can begin to have a deeper conversation with the Chinese about not only what's going on, but where is it most constructive that that uh, you know the two sides are heading? Um, short of that, you can be sure that this is going to heat up uh, more and more. And uh, you know, people are already talking about. Of course, we have a new small cold war there. Um, and I I actually think that is a good description, not in terms of nuclear weapons arms racing although the Chinese are building up, but they're, we're not racing with them in terms of numbers. So, so, so this is more like a nuclear, uh, the nuclear side of it, a nuclear competition, a strategic competition, if you will, um, that is very dynamic right now. Uh, Hans, thank you very much. There is the siren. We are out of time, uh, but I wanna thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and expertise with us today. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Hi. My name is Chase Enright, and I'm the development coordinator at Plowshares Fund. I'm also a dedicated listener to Press the Button and an advocate for eliminating nuclear weapons. Whether you're a baby boomer, millennial, or a member of Generation Z like me, I believe it's crucial that we learn about and speak up on nuclear weapons issues. Because nuclear weapons affect all our lives. That's why in-depth discussions on nuclear policy and national security, like the ones on Press the Button, are so important. To help us continue our work and support the podcast, please donate to Plowshares Fund. Whether it's $5 or $5,000, every last bit helps. We rely on the generosity of supporters and listeners just like you to fund our work to foster the next generation of nuclear scholars and activists and spread the boldest ideas for reducing the global nuclear threat. As we often hear on Press the Button, our work is more crucial than ever. Please help us keep the conversation going by visiting plowshares.org and donate today.
Dr. Caitlin Turner is a research scientist within the Space Enabled Research Group at MIT Media Lab. You recently saw her on Press the Button Live, and I have invited her back to continue the conversation. As you might remember, her research includes work on inclusive innovation practices and on principles of anti-racist technology design. She earned her PhD in geological sciences from Stanford University, was a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center, and she she was the co-author of a groundbreaking article in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists in 2020, calling for anti-racist action and accountability in the U.S. nuclear community. Caitlin, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. So you and Joan Rolfing, who leads the Nuclear Threat Initiative, had a great conversation on Press the Button Live, talking about what is holding us back from transformational change in nuclear policy. And ranging from a need to create positive futures to the lack of diversity around the proverbial table. What was your big takeaway from the conversation? I think really the takeaway from the conversation and also from the, the conference, the you know nuclear policy and the Biden administration conference, is that I think that where the nuclear field is really going through a shift right now where like if you think about the 20th century, nuclear policy and the nuclear field in the 20th century, it was very much like not for the world, right? It was for each particular country, for the United States or for its allies or for the Soviet Union and its allies. And that sort of rhetoric frames a lot of the conversations that we have about nuclear technology, whether it's about deterrence and weapons or whether it's about reactors and the spread of nuclear energy tech. And I think it's interesting because we're sort of at a point now where I think the pandemic sort of did this and also climate change. I don't think we're able to think about issues like nuclear and sectors like nuclear as like an us versus them anymore. Um, and so I think that is happening <laughs> like right now and has been happening for the last few years and will continue to happen. Um, and so I think that it'll be really interesting to see how that shift changes both in terms of the rhetoric and norms that frame policies in the nuclear field, but also the types of technologies and the types of processes that we use to uh, embed those technologies. No, you're you're totally right. And I think that conference, you know, you, you could see it, right? It's really crystallizing this shift. Now, for me, I was really struck by your comment that a fundamental assumption that's holding us back from change is that we, and I, I say we broadly, you know, those working, whether it's on nuclear energy work or nuclear weapons related work, we don't think we owe local communities anything. Can you tell us more about this? I mean, this was just like a really provocative statement that, um, you know, what two, three weeks later, I am still sitting with. I think it's helpful actually to think of like sci-fi a little bit. So if we think about the movie, The Matrix, um, where we talk about how there are glitches in the matrix and that actually shows you something about the system and how it's operating. Um, or you can fast forward to a couple of years ago where the author Rua Benjamin in her amazing book, Race After Technology, sort of described glitches in a similar way with regards to racism and other uh, divisions in, in technology. And basically the premise is that when you have a system and it's operating really well, most of the time, how it's intended to operate, but then you have, you know, a glitch of some sort, the glitch is actually not quite random, right? It's, it's actually telling you something about the system. It's telling you how it's intended to work, how it isn't intended to work, who it works for and who it works with and what isn't considered. And so I think we can, apply this to nuclear. In nuclear, we do have glitches and they tell us what the boundaries and the contours of the nuclear sector are. So some examples of that, like nuclear accidents are, are obvious glitches, right? They're not supposed to happen when we have nuclear engineers that talk about like, oh, nuclear is safe. Look how many people nuclear doesn't kill. Um, but then we have accidents and we aren't able to meaningfully talk about how to you know, compensate um, justly the victims of accidents or how to talk about the environmental impact of having an entire community of people having to leave abruptly, be displaced um, and face social stigma of being the victim of an accident. 
Uh, or in the policy realm, we have this like power structure of nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states, which would suggest like an order and a privilege and sort of how the system is supposed to work. And yet we had the Van Treaty, which was composed entirely of non-nuclear weapon states, won a Nobel Prize. So that's kind of a glitch within itself, right? You shouldn't have a bunch of non-nuclear weapon states coming up with a treaty that wins a Nobel Prize. And the fact that the nuclear weapon states are an, unable to even grapple with beginning to recognize that, that treaty. Or the fact that we talk about nuclear energy as we frame it often as a tool to address climate change, which is great, um, but we have no meaningful or equitable way to do this regarding the logistics of nuclear energy, regarding, you know, the specific size of the reactors we're using, regarding where we're going to use them, who's going to build them, who's going to sell them and buy them, or anything else, or specifically regarding the fact that some of the most severe impacts of climate change will be felt in the global south. And we have no acceptable way or workable way to uh, have nuclear energy in the global south that won't send the, the powers that be into a, a tailspin. Or the fact that we sort of have invested heavily in how to build and modernize weapons, how to put them in various places um, in the air or underwater or on land or, or in space or whatever. But we really have no idea how to pragmatically dismantle them. And one small piece of that, which is not a small piece, is just what to do with the plutonium that's in those weapons. Um, that's kind of a glitch. Uh, nuclear waste itself is a glitch. And I'm not even just talking about energy like reactor waste or weapons waste. I'm talking about communities that host nuclear facilities all over the world, whether they're weapons, reactors, uh, mining, milling, all these sorts of facilities. Um, and they're hosting these like material and processes, these industrial processes all over the world. But the benefits of nuclear tech are largely, you know, national and international. So it's like the benefit of a country being able to say like, look, we have this really fancy warhead and it, it's awesome and it can do these things. So don't, don't mess with us. Or the benefit of a country saying, we have this giant reactor and, you know, we've put it in a bunch of different sites all over our country and we're not emitting carbon as a result of that. So it's like we have funneled the benefits of nuclear tech into these two broad sets of technologies, but how we make those technologies is, you know, diffusely spread out on communities. The burdens of nuclear are squarely on communities and they're oftentimes specific communities, whether they're indigenous, uh, largely just black and brown people all over the world, right? And so when we think about super fun sites, legacy sites, sites where we did weapons testing, we really fail to have a conversation about resources for addressing these sites and these communities or like why it happens this way and continues to happen in the first place. And so that's a major glitch, right? This, that's huge. Um, and then even when we think about siting new uh, nuclear waste facilities, for example, we're always looking to find communities that are basically unable to say no. So we might, from an equity and justice perspective, look at that and say like, well, that's appalling, that's a glitch, why are we doing that? But that glitch is telling you that the system works that way. It works in such a way that we should be putting, we should be looking to communities like that to host these facilities. So I think that's a, you know, that's a big answer to that question, but it's really in every part of the nuclear sector from basically when we harvest or mine materials to how we process them, and then ultimately turn them into these you know, either weapons, warheads, or um, reactors, right? Like all through that system, there are basically communities everywhere that we don't, we don't care about because that's not the point of the nuclear sector. Now, when we get into this question of of glitches and systems, I mean, I'm you're, I'm like now like firmly back in my undergraduate courses when they're using the matrix to explain to me epistemology, which I I think is what you're starting to get at with this. So how do you apply that understanding of epistemology in a way that can start to shape or ameliorate the system? You're right, that this is getting at epistemology essentially. And so when we talk about epistemology, we're talking about like, what is considered knowledge? What is considered expertise? What is considered ridiculous in the realm of a field? All of those questions are about epistemology. 
the one way that I think if people aren't used to thinking about it in this way, you can look at your standard engineering curriculum or your standard policy curriculum at a, a college or you could look at funding priorities for a funding organization um, and basically look at the question of who or what is there and who or what isn't there. Um, so, you know, in a lot of engineering curriculums, it is not required explicitly um, to have a class about ethics. Um, and a lot of times if you do have a class about ethics, it's not in the engineering department, right? It's like you have to go over to the other side of the school, um, the humanities or social sciences to take an ethics class. But engineering as a field is full of issues and questions around ethics. So when we say like, what makes an engineer an expert in engineering? What, you know, how does this, how does one become an engineer? It does not include ethics or it includes ethics as like an extracurricular almost, right? And then I think for policy too, a lot of times when we talk about policy, we're talking about, you know, one side of policy. We're sort of not getting at, you know, or explicitly saying the fact that it's like policy from a Western perspective or from a United States perspective or from an imperialist perspective or a colonial perspective or whatever it is, because that's the contour of, of the field. Um, you know, it's so things like who gets to define the field also are a part of epistemology. So if you have a colleague or a scholar in your organization who's basically pushing and saying like, we need to consider a feminist lens or we need to consider an environmental justice lens or we need to consider, you know, an, an accident theory lens or whatever it is. And that's when people make comments like that, that's getting out of epistemology. That's saying like the way you've defined this field is not sufficient. And it's, it's leaving out certain questions that are really important. Um, Another way this works is like what is considered scholarly and what isn't, right? We know there's a ton of gatekeeping in, you know, basically the written word and, and expertise. So whether it's peer-reviewed journal articles, which are notoriously subjective in some ways, um, but it's still the best system we've come up with, or whether you're at a university or an institution that like puts out a, a, a report and because you're at that institution, which you know, there's lots of gatekeeping and sort of hoops that you have to jump through to get to that institution, then you have access to write an op-ed or then you have access to contribute to this report. And so what happens if like, you know, there are people who are not at these institutions who are writing something that is expertise, but the system can't recognize it as expertise because it's not coming from one of these sources that we consider reputable. So that's another way to think about it. Uh, another way too is thinking about what is an important moment in a field's history. So in nuclear, we, you know, it's interesting because like we talk about how today, you know, it's like, oh, like it was bad <laughs> that we dropped the bombs in Japan, but we still mark the occasion. Um, we still like regard it as an important moment in the field's history. And we regard it as an important moment in the field's history, not from this like human lives sort of shaping the world sort of perspective, but in, an achievement, the same way we would regard, um, you know, Neil Armstrong going to the mood as an achievement. So that's an epistemology thing. I think your question of how do we apply this, I actually want to say how we how we don't apply this, because I think this is what I have seen over the last year or so. So what we shouldn't be doing is we shouldn't just be grabbing texts based on feminism or based on an anti-colonial perspective or based on an anti-racist perspective and critical race theory or whatever from people who have that expertise and then putting that into our own ivory towers, that is not actually an equitable way of including epistemology, right? And it's actually pretty messed up, but that's actually what we've seen a lot of over the past year and a half um, is people saying like, oh, I really like this article or I really like this book or I really like this perspective. So I'm just gonna add this to my syllabus and then I'm going to, with my power and with my relative privilege and with my relative um, advantages at XYZ institution, I'm going to write a grant application or write a paper that's, that's basically taking these ideas and making them my own. Um, that's not an equitable way to apply epistemology. Um, we need to actually be 
investing in people and in their ideas, right? So we, we shouldn't be trying to power hoard it. We shouldn't be trying to be pivoting the way we might pivot. But what we can do, I think, is like, if there's a scholar that you really like their work, don't just put their work, you know, in your syllabus, like maybe invite them to be a fellow at your institution. Um, don't just invite them to serve on a panel and have it be unpaid. And then you can sort of like plaster their picture everywhere online. Actually, you know, invest in them and try to do something for them or with them. Um, that's actually how you start to apply these principles. So now I want to ask you the same question I asked Joan, because you just talked about, you know, what we've seen over the last year and when our conversation right now has really been kind of near term. What are the things that you're seeing now or people can do now? What does this field look like seven years from now if we start applying the type of lens to our work that you're talking about? Yeah, so I think this is actually kind of already happening, and I think that other fields it's also happening within. Going back to the first question you asked me about the takeaways from the, the conference, I do think there is this moment going on right now from a bunch of different factors where we're, we're not able to see things as isolated in terms of like this benefits this country or this benefits you know this block of countries anymore i think climate change is doing that the pandemic is doing that it's interesting because some sectors that are advanced tech like i would say the aerospace sector right has there's tools within the aerospace sector that any country or any organization can use and embedded in that is sort of this message or this norm that like you know, aerospace technology could advance infrastructure and justice and development for any country. And I think nuclear is sort of being invited to that table right now. I think the ban treaty was a really important part of this. I also think the different countries in the global south who are really trying to say like, hey, we, we actually want to become part of the nuclear game. And it's interesting because you know, the Northern and Western world sometimes reacts to those countries with a lot of skepticism because it's like, well, you have a lot of oil, so why would you want a nuclear reactor? Um, and so it's sort of this having to acknowledge over five to 10 years that like, hey, like the reasons that we think that countries might be invested in nuclear are not the only reasons that countries might be invested in nuclear. Um, so that I think is happening already and we're sort of being forced to see it because it's happening persistently. It's not like a short term thing, but it's happening over like five to 10 year scales. And then also we're seeing tons of, you know, companies and organizations that are really invested in this, like, you know, we need to do nuclear better. We need to do nuclear more equitably. We need to rethink reactors. We need to rethink the whole nuclear fuel cycle and all of its processes and all of its assumptions. Um, and those organizations have reached a point where they can't be dismissed anymore. I think there was a point where people were like, ah, don't worry about it. But now we're past that. And so I think if we follow that trajectory, I think if we follow the trajectory as well as generally just big socio-technical STEM issues becoming global, I think we see a much more diffuse, but also, I, don't, I mean, I, and I don't mean diffuse in a bad way, but diffuse, but also fairer nuclear field. I don't think it takes seven years. I think it takes like 20 or 30 years, but I think we'll start to see meaningful progress in that regard. You know, maybe it looks like the way Plowshares, for example, has a ton of women in its organization, right? that's something, the way that Gender Champions is an initiative, right, that's something, the way that organizations like Women of Color Advancing uh, Peace and Security is an organization, right, um, the way that, you know, we are starting to really have to consider what a regulatory framework might look like to have micro-reactors versus, like, having these giant reactors that, uh, you know, are the way we've been doing them for decades. Um, and the way the, the ban treaty made it so that we have to take non-nuclear weapon states seriously as stakeholders and not as like this uh, class of underlings, I guess. So I think it's happening. And I think that what I would say too is like, we're, nuclear is not alone in this regard. So I think it's all happening. It's happening because of all the profound shifts that our planet is experiencing right now.
Um, and I, th yeah, I think the future is, could be bright for nuclear in a good way. And just to make sure, because we have a variety of people in our audience, when you talk about countries investing in, especially in the global South or um, in, you know, non-nuclear weapon states, you're talking about the nuclear tech energy technology or peaceful applications in terms of their investments, right? Absolutely. We're talking about assumptions. There was this assumption that like a country, if it had the ability to have um, nuclear material or nuclear technology would definitely build a weapon. But we just had dozens of countries sign a treaty and say, we're not interested in these. <laughs> like, we don't want them. We, we do not want nuclear weapons. We don't want anyone to have them, right? And so I think that was an important step with challenging that rhetoric, challenging that, that uh, defensiveness, um, challenging those norms, right? So I think energy, I mean, a lot of a lot of countries have expressed interest in nuclear energy, but currently the systems of, of doing it really aren't workable, right? And so I think that that's going to change. And I think one of the reasons it will change is because of treaties like the Ban Treaty, which, you know, we're, we're basically saying, yeah, we're not interested in this, but we are interested in this. We'd, we'd like to make this happen. And you know, I, I could talk to you for a lot longer than this, but unfortunately we do have to wrap up. My final question for you, you know, as we take the theory and put it into practice, what can the audience do to help create this long lasting progress? So I think the one thing we can all do is we can always question um, our own positionality in a system. I think that's really important, right? Um, like this is something I try to do very often. I think everyone should be doing it. We are oftentimes thinking of the ways that we're burdened by systems, right? Like by intersectionality, you know, you, you'll see people say like, oh, I'm, I'm black and I'm queer and I'm a woman or whatever. But what they're not saying is like, you know, both of my parents went to college. I live in the United States. I was born in the United States. I have a PhD, like all these other different markers that also shape your lens. And so I think at an individual level, if everybody could just examine not just their, their burdens and how, how different systems of power impact them, but also how they benefit, because I don't care who you are, like there's, everyone has something, right? We don't all have equal things, but everyone has something. Going back to epistemology, we have to keep pushing to authentically and equitably include this um, in all of the domains of the nuclear sphere and really include it, not just like culturally appropriate it, but, but include it. And then further too, I think that we have to be willing to have conversations with people in the field who do profoundly disagree with us, right? Because the reality is we're not starting from a system that, you know, where it's new and we have the opportunity to create norms from scratch. We have really entrenched norms. And I think we can't go about it by saying anyone who believes in deterrence, I'm not going to talk to them or anyone who believes in the NPT, I'm not going to talk to them or anyone who believes that like, you know, countries in whatever part of the world shouldn't have nuclear reactors, I'm not going to talk to them. I think we have to recognize ways to have productive conversations where we can stand our ground and say like, no, this is why I think this is wrong but also acknowledge that a lot of the field were, does disagree with these perspectives. And then finally, I would say, I think nuclear can and should learn from other sectors which are grappling with these same issues. Um, and I'll leave with this point, which is I think the space sector. So recently, um, myself and my colleague, Aditi Verma and my colleague, uh, Daniel Wood just wrote a paper about basically comparing the nuclear sector and the space sector in terms of anti-racism, intersectionality, and anti-coloniality. And these sectors are really interesting because not to say that uh, the nuclear sector is uniquely bad or that the aerospace sector is uniquely good, but they can really learn from each other, right? These are sectors where you have um, basically dual use technology emerging during a time where nationalism is really important and shaping the world order in terms of like, you know, uh, democracy and communism is really important where you have sort of technocratic displays of nationalism and patriotism and things like that. And yet in aerospace, we have, for example, 
lots of different technologies that enable different countries and different organizations, literally like high school students, to become stakeholders. Um, you know, anyone can basically, any group of people can get together and build a small satellite. And that small satellite actually has a chance of going into space through some sort of like fair and equitable process. And anyone, once that small satellite is in space, that data could, you, depending on how you set it up, it could be used just by your organization or that could be used by anyone, right? And that data is what you use to set up things like GPS and figure out infrastructural planning and really important markers of development, right? And so the fact that like these two sectors, which, and similar in the fact that they deal with multiple types of technologies, um, you know, that Aero, has, Aero Astro has figured out a way to sort of start to do this. And it's definitely not perfect. It's definitely not, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that uh, aerospace is like the beacon of the just sector because it's definitely not. But I think nuclear, you know, could learn from sectors like Aero, from, uh, from sectors like climate, uh, you know, and renewable energies, for example. And so I would say nuclear should stop thinking it's so unique. It is unique. It is special but we can learn from other sectors. Caitlin, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me and for you know, having this conversation. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Lauren Billet in Washington, D.C. and by Jacqueline Shing, Delphine Vigil in San Francisco. Research and assistance from Alex Hall, Angela Kellett, Harry Tarpey, and Desiree Sepetis. Audio engineering and sound design by Michael Padilla at the Soundport Recording Studio in Grass Valley, California. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen, and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.